Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Shannon's Lumber Industry Update. We're on episode 57 today. And I'm going to talk about a couple things, but I think I'll probably call this Steaming Wood 101 because it's going to be our primary topic. I've got a couple of questions that kind of back up the points that I'll be making in steaming. So talk about a couple of things. Certainly the, the cupping or wood movement you're going to see in boards, um, how we might go about storing some freshly felled trees, the color changes that you can expect to see in the differences between plywood and solid wood. We're going to be talking about some walnut grade specifically as it applies to steaming lumber and we're going to wrap things up with kind of this lumber steaming 101 conversation should be a good show kind of all in the same theme i hope we'll see what happens uh, as usual i want to say thank you to everybody who supports the show on patreon if you go to patreon.com lumber update you can sponsor the show there i just like you guys a lot that's enough. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Let's move on here. Um, in industry news, I was talking about modified woods a couple episodes ago, and I highlighted a particular resin modified uh, product called Lignia. Well, there's been some ongoing things with Lignia for a while, and I've been hesitant to talk about it as things were still developing, but Lignia had some funding issues. Um, their, one of their investors pulled out, and they kind of put everything on hold. And this was a particularly, uh, well, it should say it was a really bad time because it was already supply chain issues going on with the whole COVID thing. And they were having a particularly difficult time getting new uh, investors. Long story short, they never did get new investors and they put the company up for sale. And one of their competitors, Akoya, actually I shouldn't even call Akoya a competitor, Lignia, Akoya, yeah, Akoya was a competitor to Lignia. Lignia was probably more a blip on the Akoya radar because Lignia was kind of a newcomer to the market. Well, Akoya bought Lignia and did nothing with it. <laughs> in a typical corporate fashion, they bought it in order to squash it. Uh, you know, this makes me think of Microsoft or Oracle or, frankly, a lot of the automotive industry buying new emerging technologies, new emerging competitive products, and putting them to sleep. So, I don't know. Maybe Akoya will choose to do something with it. It's a pretty similar product to what they're producing. It's more physical modification than the chemical modification that Akoya is going for. I'm, I'm sad about this because I really was a fan of what Lignia was about. It was kind of the best of all of the modification type processes. Um, I'm hopeful that someone will give it a go. Um, certainly what they were doing is not, you know, 11 secret herbs and spices. Resin uh, impregnation, uh, physical modification of, of lumber is certainly not a new idea. Lignia did have some proprietary stuff going on that helped with color fastness. And uh, they had jiggered with the formulation a little bit in the resin in order to get kind of where they were with uh, fire prevention, um, flame spread, all that fun stuff that they were rated really strongly on. I really do hope that someone will give this a go and hopefully that someone will have more funding secured when they do it. So yeah, sorry about that, folks. I talked about Lignia pretty uh, as kind of a great product in the Modified Wood episode and they are a casualty of, we'll just call them a casualty of COVID. Now, some feedback. I talked about balsa. Um, I think that was just the last episode. Um, a gentleman was trying to make fishing lures and he was having trouble finding uh, balsa wood other than like the small blocks you might find at like a craft store. Well, I got some really good feedback from folks. Um, first, Palmer wrote in and said that um, when he was a kid, his uncle, who was an airplane mechanic, actually took him to one of the maintenance facilities and they had a 727 in the shop that was stripped down. The entire floor of the aircraft was balsa plywood. Um, due to the strength and weight reduction over more dense woods, it was the ideal medium. This is absolutely uh, true. I wonder though, how true is it anymore? Um, I know that like uh, Boeing, as they moved into later models, especially their big airplanes, like the 787, there's a lot of carbon fiber in that. Now I do know they're using laminated plywood type products. They use a lot of foam type products. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, however, and those foam products are usually like the outer plies or carbon fiber. I wouldn't be surprised, however, if there wasn't some balsa core 
um, sheet goods being used in aircraft. We'll find the same thing in the marine industry where weight can be a factor, where they're using uh, honeycomb type products or foam products. And in some instances, you are still finding balsa. But here again, in reference to um, the gentleman who's having trouble finding solid balsa, um, it, it's difficult to find solid balsa because a lot of it is being used in sheet good type applications like Palmer's talking about in the plywood, the balsa plywood that was in the floor of the 727. Anybody in the aeronautical industry, I'd be curious to know, because uh, the 727 is an old plane. I don't even know if Boeing's making them anymore. Um, but is that still the case in more of the modern manufactured planes? I know carbon fiber, like the carbon fiber that's in my racing bike is not the same carbon fiber that you find in an aircraft. Like the aeronautical industry gets the finest carbon fiber that's out there. And the bicycle industry kind of gets like the tertiary tier. It's still good stuff, but there are different grades of, of carbon fiber, just like there are different purities of shellac. Um, you know, and you can, depending on which solvent you're using, you can get a higher quality, more refined quality of shellac. Same thing with carbon fiber. I would love to hear from someone who is in the know what is actually being used in the aerospace industry now. Um, carrying on, um, this one was particularly interesting. I had not thought of this. Um, Oh, shoot. And I forgot who sent this in. I apologize to whoever sent this in, but um, they said, I was listening to your latest podcast on my drive to work today and heard your comments about balsa. You might have missed a source for larger species, surfboards. When I moved to California years ago, I was surprised to see 12 quarter pieces of balsa, 10 or more feet long. Local board shops bought them to make old style long boards. It might be worth checking out West to see what is available. That is fascinating. And kind of like the airplanes, I wonder, is this still the case? Uh, you know, stand up paddle boards have become ridiculously popular. In a lot of instances, they rely on kind of a torsion box assembly. And I know there's a lot of people here again, using marine grade plywood to do this. And some of them are using lighter weight plywood. Um, we sell a fair amount of our feather core product for this application as well. And the, the weight reduction not only is in the, the Falcata core, which is, uh, um, so we say comparable to balsa, but because it's built in a torsion box and you've got a lot more dead air in there that's skinned over top, you end up with a very stable board, but also very lightweight. I don't think you could pull that off with a long board. I do think you need to have uh, more solid wood, but I don't know enough about surfing to know that. Still, I think that's kind of a fascinating idea. I did not think of that at all. And again, I left off the name of who submitted this. I sincerely apologize because that's a really cool tip. And then finally... This one I find really fascinating. Jeremy wrote in and said, check out rogergeorge.com. They sell eight foot two by fours made from balsa. They are specifically catering to prop makers because you'll find on a lot of movie sets, furniture is made out of balsa because it does break easily. It's meant to, you know, pick up this table and smash it over somebody's head in a, in a fake bar fight, or they dive through a window and fall on a table and it breaks underneath them. The balsa is specifically sought after because they're not going to kill the stunt man when you throw them into the table. So they're selling two by material in order to make this type of prop furniture. And uh, that's an interesting resource. Again, rogergeorge.com. I'll put that link in the show notes. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That I would have never thought of. Very, very cool. It's one of the things I love about this show is I can put out a question like that and we get these people who have, you know, experience in various other industries to clue us in from clue this schmo and all the industry experience I have as a lumber industry. So very, very cool stuff. All right, let's move on to some of our questions here. All right, my first question comes to me from Ken, and he's got a question about the cupping of boards. He said, I have heard that growth rings and flats on boards always want to straighten out. In other words, a flat board will always cup eventually and will always cup towards the convex side of the growth rings. Is this cupping due to increasing moisture content or decreasing moisture content, such as the amount of cup is always changing? Or is it related to age or some other mechanism such that it just gets progressively more cupped or over time? Or, of course, is cupping just a function of drying and stops moving once the board reaches equilibrium? So the answer is, isn't quite as cut and dried as you might think. Sorry for that. That was a really bad pun. Um, although I have to say a lot of puns that we get come from the lumber industry. Your average run of the mill pun isn't that cut and dried. 
Ooh, but it dovetails nicely into this segment. Oh, that was bad. So I, you know, I, I've heard this as well. You know, the board will always cup towards the bark side, um, the convex side. I kind of don't like that adage because I don't think it's always true. I mean, I suppose if you have a perfectly centered cathedral pattern, so the apex of that um, cup is right in the center. Some might actually call that a pattern grade board. Um, I suppose you might say that, but the other question that Ken has, is it due to increasing or decreasing moisture content? So is it always going to cup to the convex side? Not necessarily. See, what's really happening is as the moisture increases, the fibers suck up more water and they swell. As the moisture decreases, the fibers shed water and they shrink. So because the tree, the growth rings in a tree are in a big circle, as those fibers, and again, think of, think of a whole bunch, a bundle of straws. And as you pump water into those straws and the hollows fill up, the straws will start to expand and they push each other out. Well, since they're organized in rings anyway, essentially that the radius of those rings, that circle gets larger. The tree swells overall. Well, when you're only looking at a segment of that circle, the board will begin to cup and it cups along that circle. So you're, you're getting an arc. It's, it's not moving necessarily in a straight line across the width of the board. It's moving across an arc. That arc is equal to whatever the radius of that growth ring or growth rings visible in that board. And as it sheds moisture, that radius is shrinking. So the board is certainly expanding across the width, but it's kind of expanding on an arc, not in a straight line, which is why you're getting that cupping. The edges of the boards are kind of turning down a little bit. So you can't really say it's always going to cup towards the convex side because it's not. Um, a lot of it depends upon the radius of that growth ring through the board. It depends on whether it's increasing or decreasing in moisture. So rather than applying kind of a rule of thumb that it's always going to cup this way or that, it's important to understand the mechanism. And that's that swelling of those fibers, that increase or decrease in the radius based on whether it's taking on moisture or reducing moisture. As far as is it a mechanism related to age, Absolutely not. And, and this is what I, I find is a, is a particular misinformation. You get a lot of people will say, you know, this board has moved and, you know, it's reclaimed and it's like it was cut like 300 years ago. It should be perfectly stable. Not at all. Wood will never stop moving. I, I guess that's not entirely true. If it becomes petrified wood, then it will stop moving. Even then, I wonder. You know, I'm pretty sure it would take a lot of moisture. You'd have to like rehydrate that. No, even then, because now it's 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 been... Um, what's the word? Solicified? Is that a word? <laughs> it's petrified. Petrified. Duh. It's turned into rock. Got to remember my Greek roots there. Petros meaning rock. Um, <laughs> unless it's petrified wood, it's always going to move. It's always going to be able to absorb and shed moisture. Now, the older that board is, the more time those cell walls have had to dry out and harden. As they get older, they may get more brittle because they've just hardened over time. It doesn't mean that it won't take on moisture. It means that it takes longer for it to absorb moisture. So a passing storm is not going to mean a thing to that really old board. You know, the humidity may spike for an hour and then drop back after that. And there won't be any time for that water to absorb into the board. Whereas a freshly cut tree that still has nice, soft, spongy cell walls will actually absorb that moisture in that passing storm over the course of an hour. Um, you know, you're not going to see massive amounts of change in those moisture spikes uh, over the course of a couple minutes to an hour in most of your boards, especially kiln dried boards. You're not going to see it at all because, again, when you kiln dry something, you're baking it and hardening those cell walls. It takes a long, uh, a prolonged, I should say, amount of moisture increase in order to see those changes, like seasonal changes. You know, gradually in the winter, especially as you turn on the heat in the house, the humidity will drop in the house. And over time, it's evaporating moisture out of the furniture, the wood in your house. Uh, the doors shrink in the frames, the drawers shrink in their cupboards, the breadboards on your dining room table may not be flush anymore. So then as you move into the summer and the humidity starts to increase, it's not like suddenly one June, the door is stuck. 
but the door might start to rub a little bit in early June and come July, it's a little bit stickier. Come August, you can't get the thing open. You got to throw your body weight into it. It's slowly absorbing moisture over a longer period of time because it has been kiln dried. This is why people say kiln dried lumber is more stable. It's not that it doesn't move. It's that it takes longer to absorb the moisture. Moreover, it's shorter for it to shed the moisture. Because those cell walls are hardened, they're not really holding on to the moisture like you know a nice spongy cell wall would be. So yes, you might see it change a little bit as an age, but that has nothing to do with the mechanism of age other than the fact that you know the wood gets older and brittle because it's been dried and wet and dried and wet and dried and wet and eventually it just gets brittle. So think about this as that expansion and contraction and that swelling and that shrinking and understand where are you now? Like, where am I in the moisture cycle of my shop or of my house? Am I in a particularly moist month and, or are we in a transition month? Are we in the fall and things are getting drier or are we in the spring and things are getting wetter? And that's particularly important as you're building because you need to know, is this drawer going to swell in its case or is it going to shrink in its case? Or is it kind of as, you know, is it as fat as it's going to get, is it as narrow as it's going to get? If you understand that, you know how to build it and how much room to add in your frame and panel or how much in your drawer, etc. The board will technically stop moving once it reaches equilibrium, but equilibrium is a moving target. And that's the important part to remember. Unless your shop is perfectly climate controlled all the time, that target of of equilibrium is constantly in flux as the seasons change. Obviously, that's going to vary depending on on where you live. You'll still see some seasonal changes, but it may be a lot less if you're living in Arizona versus living in Mississippi. So understand the structure behind it. And I'd be really leery of applying like rules of thumb to wood movement. Because the minute you think the rule of thumb is right, you've got a board that has wiggly grain on it and it's all out the window. So understand the shrinkage, the swelling and contraction, and you'll be just fine. Which brings me to a question from Scott, who says, I'm picking up some felled trees that were felled less than a week ago, and I was going to store them in my mom's basement until they're dry as I don't have room to store them myself. Is there a chance this will infest the basement with bugs or anything else I need to be concerned about? Scott, I think there is a definite chance it could infest the basement with bugs. And say it won't. Say there are no bugs in that tree. There's a lot of reasons that this is bad. Um, So first of all, he says he's picking up some felled trees. I wouldn't want to store a tree inside. Um, you go to, go to a sawmill and you'll see a log yard in the back, you know, lots and lots of logs piled on top of one another. Um, talk to like a green woodworker or a Windsor chair maker. And a lot of times they will tend to buy logs and they will keep them in log format uh, until they actually need them. The log is actually a great insulator. The bark and everything around the log can hold in moisture for a very, very long time. But also you think about the, the adage, what is, what is the, here I, here I go with a rule of thumb. I just told you not to pay attention to those, but um, the lumber needs one year per inch of thickness to dry, right? We've all heard that. So obviously the thicker uh, a board, the longer it's going to take to dry. Well, a log is pretty dang thick. You know, even skinny little logs are still very thick in terms in, in relation to your typical four quarter or eight quarter board. You know, a log could be 32 quarter, it could be 64 quarter, it could be 384 quarter. I don't know. Is that a multiple of four? I don't know. But you get the idea. The thicker it is, the more it's going to hang on to that moisture. Moreover, with the bark on the outside, that is an insulator. Now, it's also a place for bugs to hang out. So if you have a tree that still has bark on it, there's every chance that there are bugs in there. If this was felled a week ago, um, and I didn't pay attention to the date when Scott sent this, but I feel like it was sent relatively recently. So I'm recording this in the summer. The sap is rising, folks. The trees are growing. They're in their their fast growing stage because the weather is warm. There's a lot more rainfall. There's more moisture and things like that. So where there is more moisture, there's more food flowing through the tree. Food is also known as sugar, which means there are bugs. So if these trees were felled in the spring and summer months, they are filled with bugs. They're also going to be super filled with water. They're going to be heavy. So if you take a log and you stick it in your mom's basement, 
is it a finished basement? Is it an unfinished basement? I don't know. Um, I wouldn't do it regardless. First of all, logs are super heavy. They're difficult to move around. It's going to make a lot more sense to break that down into a board because it will dry faster. B, it will be a lot easier to move that around. And C, you're going to be able to put some ventilation on the board and have air flowing around the board. So if I had boards, I would stack and sticker them in the basement and I would have put a fan on one end to constantly blow air through that stack to evaporate off the moisture that's that's leaching out of the wood. If I stuck a log down there and put a fan on it, it's not going to do a whole lot other than check the crap out of the end. Um, you're never really going to get any of that moisture removed from the center of that log and therefore it's liable to just sit there and mold. So say there were no bugs in that log, it's going to mildew and mold and probably rot. So not really a good idea to put a log in someone's house. If you don't have any space to store that um, other than in your mom's basement, that's fine, but get it sawn into boards first. Seal the ends of those boards. If you're concerned about bugs, spray them with a borax solution to try to kill some of those bugs. If you're still concerned about them, get those boards um, kiln dried. Um, And then you can put them in your mom's basement until you use them. Um, It's just not a good idea to put an actual log indoors. Too many things can go wrong with that. Uh, Let's see. Jim has a question about some cherry plywood that he bought. I bought some cherry plywood at a local hardwood vendor. It's very light, light colored. Um, at first I thought he meant weight. It's very light, almost like white oak. And then I, I realized he, no, <laughs> cherry's much lighter than, than white oak from a weight perspective. So he bought some cherry that's very light in color. It looks similar to white oak. I also bought some solid cherry for the same project from a local lumber mill that is very pink. What causes the difference and is there any way of telling how they will age? I'm not planning on using any stain or dye in the finish. So this goes into the color of woods and the color changes, which we're leading towards steaming. Pay attention, folks. <laughs> so the the color of the wood is caused by a variety of things, but it's, it's the chemicals in the wood itself. Um, some people may refer to them as extractives, and I've talked about and I used that word extractive before. Maple syrup is an extractive from the maple tree. We extract the maple syrup and we put it on our pancakes. Anything you extract from the wood, uh, tongue oil is a good example, walnut oil is another example, palm oil, turpentine, these are all extractives that come out of the wood. These are the oils, the resins, the various chemicals and compounds that are found in the wood, and that's what actually produces the color. So when a tree is growing, when a wood cell is first formed, it's essentially white, and it's wide open. It's a big wide open pore, and it's meant to suck up water. In that water is nutrients. Water from the ground soil has filled with nutrients, and that's how the tree feeds itself, and the tree continues to grow. Over time, basically, what's the name of that book? Everybody poops. <laughs> Trees poop too, folks. So when they've sucked up the nutrients, they've brought up the water into the sapwood. Again, that white, wide open pore sapwood. And they have gotten the nutrients they need from it. Well, there's waste left over, right? That waste gets transported via the medullary rays. Those are the spokes on the wheel. If you look at the, the tree being you know circular wheel, Those spokes, the medullary rays, transport that waste material into the center of the tree. That waste material is all those chemical compounds, all those resins and extractives. They settle into the center of the tree, and over time, those wide open pores get filled up with the extractive. Those extractives have color. They change the color of that wood in the center, comes to be known as the heartwood. The heartwood, essentially, once the pores are filled, you can't suck up any moisture in there. You can't bring nutrient into the tree through a clogged pore. So the heartwood is really dead. The heartwood, the only thing it serves as is structure to hold up the tree. So, it, I mean, it serves a great purpose, right? If the tree falls over, it's going to die. So the heartwood is the, the harder, stronger part of the tree that serves as kind of the bone, the skeletal structure of the tree, but it's not actually alive. It's filled with waste products, extractives. That's what causes that color change. 
Now, when you mill a board, you're exposing all of those chemicals inside the board. They're immediately going to have, often can have very vibrant colors. So in the case of cherry, it can be very, very pink when it starts. But as cherry is exposed to sunlight, as cherry is exposed to oxygen, chemical reactions occur, causing those chromophores to break apart. That's what causes the color. And it causes that color to change. In the case of cherry, it goes from a really light pink into kind of a brownish red. Now, the amount of that color change and how brown it gets, how much red it retains, is a unique signature of that particular tree. What was the soil chemistry that that tree grew in? How much of the various elements and compounds that made it so pink were in that tree. Moreover, what was the concentration? It's not 100% homogenous. You're gonna have differences based upon the grain, have differences based upon the amount of rain one season, and you'll see variegation from one growth ring to another based upon how wet it was, how dry it was, was there a fire, was there something you know in the air, any particulates or pollutants in the air that can cause different staining. Um, how much pitch is in the tree. Pitch would again be an extractive and cherry often has those little pitch pockets in them as well. So many different things that are unique to that tree that can cause that different color. The other thing at play here is you're talking about plywood versus solid wood. Well, plywood obviously is using very, very thin veneers on that surface. So you're stripping away a lot of the extractives down to like a single layer Already that wood is going to be, um, uh, it could be very, very peak, pink when the veneer was first sliced or possibly um, um, turned or, uh, well, no, sliced, depending on whether it was rotary sliced or um, uh, guillotine sliced. It could, it was probably very pink when that happened. But just like thicker boards take a longer time to dry, thinner boards dry really, really quickly. Moreover, the oxidization that causes that pink color to turn into a, a brown color happens very, very quickly because there's very little material to that wood. You know, if you take a, a sheet of commercial veneer and put a drop of water on it, the thing will start to cup immediately because there's very little thickness to it, but there's also very little strength in that really thin piece. The same thing is going on here with that color leaching. It will happen very, very fast. So in most instances, by the time plywood lands on the shelf ready to be bought, it's already pretty brown. It, it changes color very, very quickly. Plus the heat and the, the, the press the, that is required in order to make plywood is going to start that color transformation as well. So it's going to be extremely rare. I might even say impossible that you're going to find a sheet of cherry plywood that has that freshly milled pink color to it. So how will your solid wood um, compare to the, the plywood? The solid wood is going to turn brown. It will probably never it will probably turn more brown than the plywood because of the fact that the cherry veneer on that plywood is so thin. And, you know, there's, there's going to be a whiter wood underneath it, depending on who bought the, you know, who made the plywood, it could be apple, it could be poplar, it could be fir, but it's going to be a lighter wood underneath that. And just like, uh, let me think of a good metaphor here, uh, a good example. Um, yeah. How about using dyes? Um, if you have, uh, say you're dyeing some epoxy and you put a couple drops of, of, uh, of vintage maple into the cup, the whole cup turns really, really dark because you've got a, a large, say an inch of epoxy in the bottom of that cup. But when you take that epoxy and you spread it over the surface of the board, it's not, it goes from black to like very, very light tan because there's really not that much dye when you spread that epoxy thinner. Same thing's happening here. That solid board could be very, very dark brown, but if you sliced off a thin veneer, you don't have as much pigment there. So you're gonna end up with a lighter piece, especially when you put a white wood like apple or poplar behind it. So the fresh pink solid cherry is going to darken and it will darken more than plywood. Unless your plywood is 100% cherry, which I don't know anybody that makes that, you're not going to end up with a plywood panel that's gonna be nearly as dark. Now that might be okay, depending upon your design. If you're making frame and panel, you expect a little bit of difference. Oftentimes we rely on some difference design um, focal points between the panel and the rails and styles. If you really want it to be fully homogenized, you might have to use some kind of dye in order to get it um, darker because that plywood will definitely be lighter than the solid wood. 
So that was a really long way to say that, but there was some other science that I wanted to kind of get to because as you, as I said, we're kind of building on something to start talking about steaming here. So the next question comes from Derek on some locust boards that he have that have gone all crooked. He said, a couple years ago, I had some honey locusts on into boards. They were one and a half inches thick during the drying process. They were 15 inches wide, and I cut each of them into five inch wide planks. So we've got a bunch of planks that are one and a half uh, by five inches wide. Um, the ones in the middle are all pith. After a couple of years of air drying with moisture percentages now between eight and 10%, I started to dimension this last week. I joined one face to flatten them, plane them to remove the saw marks, and then put them away for the night. It's been quite rainy and humid here in the Chicago area, and when I went out next afternoon, the boards were still flat, but a third were crooked by at least three quarters of an inch. The boards cut out of the pith are fine. If I straighten one edge and then rip the other one parallel, will it stay that way? Why did this happen? Is the heartwood absorbing less water than the sapwood? This is slated to become a rubo, so I'm anxious to get it going. So, yes, the heartwood is absorbing less water than the sapwood to the tune of nothing. Um, remember before when I talked about how those extractives, the tree poop, is pushed through the medullary rays into the center and it becomes heartwood when those pores fill up with those extractive, with those chemical compounds. That what's, that's what changes the color. That's what essentially makes it dead. Um, that's no longer absorb, absorbing water. All of the water absorption is in the open pores in the sapwood itself. So if you have a board that has sapwood and hardwood, and there's a big moisture swing, you're going to see the majority of the movement in the sapwood. Now that's not to say there's zero moisture in the heartwood. It's just not pulling in new moisture. There's going to be bound moisture in the cell walls themselves, and that's what will cause the board to continue to move, expand and contract you know, forever, like I said. And until it becomes petrified wood, it will always move and, um, and contract. But sapwood is going to move more than heartwood because of the fact that it's still got wide open pores that allow moisture to flow through it. I shouldn't say, well, there's still pores, but I, I don't want people to think that there's no such thing as pores in, in, you know, in the heartwood. Because obviously look at a species like red oak, there are big wide open pores and you will find that red oak tends to move more than something like white oak where the pores are stuffed full of tylose or, you know, crystalline substance like caulk going off a, off a, down a rabbit hole here. The important part is, is when you've got a board that's got sap and a board that's got heartwood, you can absolutely expect possibly some crookedness to develop because you're going to get a, uh, a gradient, a differential in the amount of movement from the sapwood to the heartwood. Now, why did the boards with the pith stay that way? See, pith, we have this in our head that pith is evil, that it's going to be absolutely explode. Well, Actually, when you've got pith in the center of the board, this is actually preferable in many instances, and we actually call that boxed heart. In the timber framing world, we love boxed heart because you have a full, complete circle. You know, obviously at the pith, you've got really, really small circles as that tree was really young and adding growth rings. And as it expands out, those circles get wider. Well, when you've got a board that has encased pith, you've got a full circle inside that board. So it's expanding and contracting, and it's actually allowing that board to swell and shrink uniformly on all four faces. Now, with boxed heart, it's very possible you're going to see checking, but you'll see checking on all four faces. As the entire circle expands, tension builds up on those outer layers. They stretch, and they will eventually check. But instead of it just checking on one face and the board becoming kind of a wonky parallelogram, you'll see checking on all four faces. In other words, that tension is relieved on all four faces. And if you started with a square, like a six by six, you tend to still have a six by six that's in a square-ish shape because of that full concentric ring in the pith. So pith can actually be quite stable, which is really opposite of what a lot of people think. They think it's going to cause things to explode when actually you're seeing more uniform movement. It's moving a lot, no doubt, because you've got those tightly packed concentric rings, but it's moving, um, shall I say, the, the tangential to radial ratio, the TR ratio, is actually almost one-to-one -one because you've got the full growth ring in the middle. So it's highly possible, I mean, not knowing the boards or how much pith we're talking about, how tight the growth rings are, et cetera, it's almost to be expected that your boards with pith in them will stay relatively flat. Now, 
The other thing at play here, um, I always recommend trying to remove as much, um, remove as even amount of wood from both sides of the board. So he jointed one face and then planed it to, to remove some of the milling marks, but he didn't joint, or excuse me, didn't plane the parallel face. So all he did was remove material from one face of the board, exposing fresh, moist fibers on that one face, but the other face was still the already dried fibers that had been sitting around for a while. So you've got more moisture release on one face, the freshly jointed end, than the older face that you didn't do anything with. So you're going to have that differential, which in order to come in equilibrium, it's going to go crooked on you. So in general, the best idea, if you're going to remove material from one face, you should move material from the parallel face as even amounts of material as you can. So you get even moisture um, distribution. So the board is still coming in equilibrium as it dumps moisture, but it's doing it from both faces. So you don't get that differential that causes the cup. So what you probably should have done, Derek, is joint that edge. You could have planed it if you want, but you should have planed the opposite face to get a parallel face, then quote, put them away for the night. Hope that helps. The other thing at play here, um, this really has very little to do with wood movement and more with just the size of the project you're building. You're building a workbench. You've got longer parts here. Longer parts have more of an ability to flex and bend and you're gluing them together into a tabletop or into a bench top. You can use the clamps to your advantage a lot more here. Um, a lot of people really focus on getting dead flat boards over that eight foot length or whatever, however long the bench is. Fact of the matter is, slap some glue on there, clamp it till it's blue in the face, till you're blue in the face, and it will be okay. The longer the board is, the wider the board is, the more you can actually flex that board and bring it in flat. Um, is that the best woodworking um, technique out there? I don't, I don't necessarily call it bad. It's just, that's just the way things are. You've got more flex, take advantage of that. If you don't have to try to get that board so dead flat that you're reducing the thickness of it too much, capitalize on that and rely on your clamps. So very little to do with wood movement, more with just the uh, bending strength of wood. The longer it gets, the more it's going to bend. So this brings me to the question Ben has about walnut grates. He says, my local sawmill recently was out of the eight quarter walnut I needed, and I called on some bigger suppliers in my area. There was some nomenclature in the grading and sorting walnut that was hard for me to get a good grasp of. Even after a bit of Google searching to learn more, uh, I couldn't find anything. So for instance, one of the suppliers says F1F, VQ, or better color. I understand the F1S, that's basically um, uh, 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 FAS, really. Um, but what does the VQ and better color mean? I typically prefer, well, let me answer this first. VQ means veneer quality. Um, veneer quality uh, and better color. Well, veneer quality is kind of the pinnacle of things. It's going to have the best color. It's going to have the least amount of defects. It's going to be the most attractive out there. So it's veneer quality or better um, and better color. Um, he goes on to say, I typically prefer unsteamed walnut for my projects, but are there different types of steam treatments that produce different results? One of my local mills sells steamed walnut that looks like a very dull, homogenous brown. Another had walnut that they told me was steam treated, but still had the variations of reds, purples, greens, and yellows that I usually associate with unsteamed. Was this truly steamed, or is there something different going on here? So this leads me to lumber steaming 101. I talked about this and I want to say it's episode 41 or 42, um, and I actually specifically talked about walnut steaming. I'm revisiting this because I want to talk about it on a grander scale. Um, all of the stuff we've talked about in this episode so far is kind of laying the groundwork for this. We know that, you know, the tree essentially starts white. You know, there's, there's, there's no pigment in there because there's no waste product. There's no extractive that's been deposited inside the tree. Every year as it grows um, and it deposits more waste into the center of the tree, you start to develop heartwood, which causes that color. Well, when the tree is turned into boards, you've still got the sapwood in there. The sapwood's going to be much, much lighter in color. In order to blur those lines, we inject very, very wet, 100% saturated steam into this board and that steam kind of blows through the board and it it kind of distributes those chemicals it washes some of the chemicals out of the center of the board and into those sap um, 
sections, the sections of the tree that have wide open pores that don't have any pigment in it. Well, that pigment washes out of the heartwood and into the sapwood, creating the, making the sapwood darker, but also it tends to lighten or kind of mellow out the variation of colors in the heartwood itself. So in the case of walnut, we find that there's a lot of greens and grays and reds and things. As more of those chemicals are, are washed and leached out of the center, you get a, a more blended duller brown color in the walnut. And the color that's extracted from the heartwood is bled into the sapwood turning that cream color into a lighter brown and, and really blurring the line. Whereas when the tree is first felled, there is a very distinct difference between sapwood and heartwood. Like it's a sharp line um, in the wood. And this is, this is any species. You won't see that sharp line in a steamed product because that those chemicals have been leached over through to the injection of really, really moist steam, 100% saturated steam. So we know all this, right? We, we, we know how this tree grows. And we know that if you, you did that, you would get that homogenization of color. The other thing that happens as you push this steam through is you will continue to get some chemical reactions. And those chemical reactions can cause also changes in the color itself. The same chemical reactions that turn cherry from that light pink into a brown will turn something like beech into more of a pinkish hue. As you push that steam through, you're getting chemical reactions throughout that not only homogenize the sapwood and the heartwood, but it tends to darken the much whiter heartwood into that pinkish color that makes European beech so distinctive. So you get a better yield because more of your sapwood can be counted as heartwood now. And because you're filling those pores with the extractives from the heartwood, you're getting a more stable section. I talked about before how the sapwood will move more than the heartwood. You're essentially transforming parts of the sapwood into heartwood by flushing those extractives, reducing the, the density of the extractives in the center of the board and adding, you know, taking that removed density and pushing it into the sapwood. So you're increasing the amount of sapwood, but you're also kind of changing the overall color. And like I said, with beech, it turns pink. Cherry can be steamed and cherry will, what happens is it, it moves it towards that browner color um, more, I guess, prematurely. Um, and this, this can, this is not nearly as common, but it also can help when you have particularly variegation, uh, a, a large amount of variegation in the color in the cherry. And this will happen depending on the, where the cherry is grown. A lot of the best cherry is grown in the Appalachian region or the higher river valley, cherry grown in more northerly climes might have more variation. And if you steam it, you're going to unify that. But you don't really have to steam it as much as you would something like walnut. So the answer to the last question is, are there different steaming treatments? The treatment is still pretty much the same, but how much and how long you steam it will change that. So when you've got a very dark hardwood like walnut, it's, it's the darkest domestic hardwood out there. There's a lot of extractive in that center there. So you can steam it a good long time. And in fact, you have to, in order to take that cream colored sapwood and turn it any shade of brown, you've got to steam that a really, really long time. The greater the amount of extractives, the more variation you're going to have in that color, the more reactants you should have. Um, that's why you can see greens and pinks and grays and creams in walnut, because there's a lot of chemical compound in the walnut tree itself. Uh, also one of the reasons that so many kids today have walnut allergies. There's a lot going on in walnut that you can react to. So you got to steam it a long time to get that homogenization of color. Something like beech doesn't have to be steamed as much because it's already pretty light in color, meaning there's not as many extractives in there. But you do have to steam it longer than cherry because beech is much more dense, very tiny pores, much higher density. So you have to kind of work at it a little bit longer to get a more homogenized pink color in beech. If you want to steam cherry, you actually don't have to steam it very long at all. So the amount of time that you steam it, and I'm sure there's variations in the actual temperature. Um, maybe, maybe. I don't know how much that would play a difference. I mean, you're still, you, you got to get to the boiling point, right? In order to create steam. And you're usually bubbling that steam up through a water vat in order to make sure that it's 100% super saturated, moist steam. But it's the amount of time that you're steaming it that's going to cause it variation. So you might have a mill that had pretty brown um, walnut, or maybe they didn't have a whole lot of sapwood in the walnut they put into their kiln. 
And so when they went to the steaming process, they didn't steam it very long. So you may still have more greens and color variation throughout that. That walnut also may have had um, a particularly uh, a soil particularly rich in in the chemistry that causes a lot of those color variations, which is why you can look at one walnut board that is steamed and another walnut board that's steamed, and there still be more of a stripy appearance in one over the other, just because there was more stripy appearance in that board in the first place because of the greater amount of gunk in the soil. <laughs> the gunk is great; it makes really pretty boards, but you know, wood is organic. You're going to find differences from one tree to the next, from one hillside to the next, from one valley to the next. So steaming takes all those variations and try to make them more homogenized. And I talked about this in the, whatever that is, episode 41, where in the commercial sector, where you want all the boards to look the same, you're doing, you're laying a walnut hardwood floor and you don't want that one board to stick out like a sore thumb. You steam it and you steam it a lot in order to get a very homogenized looking kiln load so that you can make a better hardwood floor. It also can be a way to stretch that sapwood, um, a, a high amount of sapwood. You can increase your yield on that. If you've got a pretty good board already, or you're not trying to create a whole bunch of equal boards, you're not milling for hardwood flooring or something like that, you might get away with less steaming. Because frankly, the less heat and everything you're doing to the wood, the faster you can get it out of the kiln, there's also less of a chance of actually creating defects. I mean, you're putting the wood through a lot of stress with high heat and a high amount of moisture. It can only, it can only lead to problems. And I talked about this in the, the last episode on steaming. Technically, steamed wood is slightly weaker than unsteamed wood because you're softening those bonds. You're softening those fibers. Just like you can stick something in a steam box and then allow it to bend because you've softened those fibers, well, you are technically breaking down some chemical compounds there. Now, it's a negligible amount. We don't have to worry, oh my God, I used steam walnut and now my chair is going to fall apart. It's not quite that bad. But still, the more you steam it, Theoretically, the more you're going to weaken that particular board. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but my wife is teaching voice lessons upstairs. So it's like we have musical accompaniment. She's currently singing something from My Fair Lady. Or technically her student is singing something from My Fair Lady, but she's singing along. Ah, music lessons in the age of COVID and Zoom calls. Such a wonderful thing. So anyway, that's kind of my rundown on steaming. There, There's a... a there's a lot that goes into it, and mostly it depends upon how much color variation is the board at the beginning, like the, the batch that goes into the kiln, versus how much do you really want coming out of it? Who's your customer? If you're making lumber for the hardwood flooring industry, you want a very uniform looking board. So you're going to steam the crap out of it, again, dependent upon the species. If you're just trying to expand your yield by making more of the sapwood heartwood, you may not steam it that long. So you're going to see variations from one load to another, from one supplier to another, from one region to another. It's the wonderful world of wood, right? It's organic, so it's all going to be different. Fortunately, we like that, right? I think we like that. So that being said, folks, Thank you. Great questions this week. I love how they all kind of built on one another to build our knowledge to allow me to talk in greater detail about lumber steaming. Thank you so much. If you have questions, go to lumberupdate.com. There's a form you can submit questions there, or you can email me directly at lumberupdate at gmail.com or look me up at lumberupdate on Instagram. I got a couple questions via uh, the DMs on Instagram this week as well. Thanks so much, everybody. Go buy some wood. Steamed wood. Any wood, I don't care, just buy some.